Okay, praise the Lord. It's good to see everybody. Thank you for praying for me. I, uh, I think I've totally recovered from my legs. I was losing the use of my legs. It was bad. I could barely go up and down the stairs. And went to the doctor. They suspected uh, nerve damage in the spine. So they scheduled me for a uh, electromyogram, but they couldn't get me in for four weeks. So I hobbled around for four weeks, and I was praying and praying. And so then, the Lord put things in my heart. So I started doing my own therapy. And I can walk. You can see me walk. Uh, guided by the Lord, I did my own therapy, and I'm, I've recovered. I don't know how well. I don't know what they'll find when I get the results of the uh, electromyogram. It's been a week, and the doctor hasn't contacted me. But I praise the Lord, and I thank you for your prayers, because I put more emphasis on prayer than anything else. The Lord may use doctors. He may use medication. And like I tell my wife whenever she's ill or something, I say the medication is to, it's like a loan to get you by until you do the things that will help you. And then you don't get off of your medication. You don't tell people in deliverance to get off their medication. We're not doctors. But the Lord can wing you off. Uh, and I had a, my la I had COVID, COVID-19 last December, and I was hospitalized twice. I said I was pretty close to dying, but eh, the Lord recovered me. And uh, uh, slowly I recovered. I'm okay now. I just had uh, physical and blood work and everything. Everything is perfect uh, for my age, too. Uh, I'll be 74 my next birthday in February. I thank the, thank the Lord for that, that I'm still strong. And I credit the Lord with that, being in deliverance, binding and loosing. A lot of prayer from the brethren, brethren in the church, brothers and sisters, and I thank you for your prayers. But uh, let me start with this message, okay? The title of my message, I had titled it, Deliverance for the Next Generation. And then I put an S at the end of it with a parenthesis. And then it ended up in the flyer, Deliverance for Future Generations. Well, I had reviewed that too. And then I thought, well, I'm not going to be talking about future generations. I'm going to be talking about three concurrent or generations occurring simultaneously. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And the Lord makes it very specific that he wants us to pass on what he shows us to the next generation and the next generation. And we're going to be starting in Deuteronomy chapter 6, if you have your Bibles, Old Testament. But we're encouraged to pass this on to our children, our children right now and our children's children. Well, I've lived so far to see six generations of my generations. And uh, if the Lord gives me at least another five years and my great-grandson, our great-grandson, Yolanda and I, if he has a child, then we will be great, great grandparents. And so I thank the Lord for that because long life, according to the Bible, for the most part, is a blessing of the Lord. There's exceptions, but he always says that he'll give you long life. And my dad had long life on my dad's side of the family. And my mother, their life is cut off short. She died at the age of 51. And uh, many of her family members died before they reached 60 or 65. So I thank the Lord for that. I owe it to the Lord. And only through, to the Lord through genetics and other things, wisdom that he's given us on how to live the right way. And, uh, you know, our diet, exercise. Exercise profits little in comparison to eternity, but it profits. And it keeps us from defiling the temple of the Holy Spirit and being lazy, passive, and allowing Satan to have ground. And we get these illnesses that are due to lifestyle. Uh, I've mentioned that before in my preaching, so I'm not going to go into that. But anyways, if you have your Bibles, turn to Deuteronomy chapter 6. You know, our children, this generation right now is living in very, very bad times. We're seeing a change in world order. We're seeing a change in the mores, the morals of human life. What was, and like I said, I'll be 74 my next birthday in a couple months. Uh, I've seen a lot of changes, and so have you. Even in, uh, we didn't even have computers, let alone, I mean, let alone computers, we didn't have calculators. We used slide rulers, and there was so much that we didn't have, and we've seen things change. And so now our generation is faced with these moral changes. I don't have to mention them one by one. You know what I'm talking about. I did a message a couple of years ago, maybe, I don't remember. Yeah, a couple of years ago, generation of demons. And this is what we're living in this time. There's a generation of demons, and the dupes use euphemisms. I mentioned that in that message, so I'm not going to go into it. To lighten the impact 
For example, alternate lifestyles. And they're in love, not in lust. And so forth to pass these lies on to this generation. They have computers. Well, when I was young, we didn't have computers. They started at uh, preschool. Facebook, Instagram. They have so much uh, social media to influence these children that we didn't have. And so to live their separated life for the Lord becomes more difficult. And it's easy for them, easier for them to be swayed. However, the word of God says, raise up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart. Raise a child in a godly way. My kids were raised here at Hegwich. My youngest was three years old, and my oldest was 14. And today, they're useful members of society. They slid, they backslid. My sons became drug dealers and so on and so forth, but the Lord brought them back, and today they're all living, uh, maybe not perfect lives. Well, none of us are living perfect lives, but they're living according to God's will in a sense, and they're useful members of society. I had one son that went to prison for four years, and if we really look at it as the way the Lord protected him, housed him in a prison so he would not be facing capital punishment with all his colleagues that are right now in prison and facing charges for those crimes and punishment for the crimes they committed while he was in prison. So I thank the Lord for that. And while he was in prison, he said that my voice kept coming to him. The Lord was speaking to him in the form of my voice, and the Lord assigned a pastor that was in prison. I don't know if he had to do with taxes or what, to minister to him. So I thank the Lord that all in all, he's in charge. He works in us both to will and to do of his good pleasure. However, like I always say, God's part we can't do. Our part he will not do. There's a lot of promises in, uh, uh, in the word of God that say, if you do this, I will do this. They're conditional. And then there's unconditional promises like Abraham that he was going to bless him. And then he told David, if your kids continue in this way. So there's a lot of conditional promises, unconditional promises, and there are futuristic promises that are going to come to pass no matter what. We can't change them. The book of Revelation is loaded with them. It's showing. And all through the Bible it shows these things that are going to come. And one of the things is this one world order is coming to pass and our children, our grandchildren, our great grandchildren, right now I have children, grandchildren, and great grandchildren. And like I said, if I live any longer, we're going to have another set there. Uh, we're going to have great great grandchildren and so the Bible gives us a formula for helping them the Bible is very explicit on our part God's part we can't do our part he will not do God does bless our children there's something called the blessings of the fathers Eli was blessed because he paid tithes in Abraham the blessing came down the bloodline. And also Jehu's son were to sit at the throne of Israel for four generations because of what their father did, their ancestor. And we see ancestral curses, sins of the fathers coming down the bloodline. You that understand deliverance and spiritual warfare, you understand this. And so we break curses over ourselves, our children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, because they go down to the third and fourth generation. God said he would visit the iniquities of the fathers upon the third and fourth generation. So we do that. We see the influence that our living has on our offspring. And so if we follow God's prescription from the beginning, many of these things could be avoided. Not only that, it's a command. If you look in Deuteronomy chapter 6, it says now, I'm going to bring my Bible up here. Uh, it says, uh, but I have written down here. Now these are the commandments and statutes and judgments which the Lord your God commanded to teach you that you might do, underline that word, do, them in the land which you go to possess. So what do we see here? What I see here, and the more you grow in discernment, discretion, and all these things that come about after you get deliverance from so many spirits, see, the, one of the objectives of deliverance is to remove all the obstacles all the blindness is that prevent you from seeing clearly the word of God. Like Pastor Mike was mentioning, you know, all of a sudden your eyes are open. Well, maybe you got deliverance in that area. It could, deliverance could come by the, the studying of the word of God, by appropriating the word of God. Well, that's what we're doing when we cast out the demons. There, 
Eviction notice was signed 2,000 years ago. They're squatters. They must go. And when we break the curses. So we see right here, Moses is talking to the Israelites. He says that you might do them in the land which you go to possess it. So I see this, that he's talking in a future tense. So I see what he's about to say. It gives me an introduction. He's about to show them to make a preparation. For what? For their deliverance. If you know the Bible, I'm not going to go too much into it, but you know what the Jews did in the wilderness. How they didn't enter the promised land, but their children did. Because they disobeyed, murmured, and complained. They were so self-sufficient. I'm going to be extracting concepts and exposing evil spirits here. It's up to you to catch them. And it depends on where you are spiritually will determine what you catch. That's why as I was talking downstairs, some people say, Oh, I don't like that preacher. I don't agree with him. Well, the disagreement may be due to your spiritual blindness, or it may be due to his error. And it merits asking the Lord. Okay? Because nobody's perfect. So we see here a preparation. Moses, by guidance of the Lord, is going to prepare this group of people to go into the promised land. And that's a picture of deliverance for us. Remember when they went into the promised land, what did they encounter? Giants. The giants are symbolic of the demons in our bodies, mind, will, and emotions. Our spirit is sealed to the day of redemption, squeaky clean. Demons can't touch it. Oh, they'll cluster. They believe the human spirit's in the base of the head right here by the cerebral. And they'll cluster around and they call that demonic oppression because they can't get in. I went through that. But even though our spirit is sealed, our soul, mind, will, and emotions, and our body continues to be contaminated. And that's where we work out our deliverance. Working out your own salvation, your own deliverance, it means there. The engrafted word, which is able to save your soul. Mind, will, and emotions, and your body. Present yourself a living sacrifice, Romans 12, 1 and 2. Present your body a living sacrifice, holy and except unto God, which is your reasonable service, your spiritual service. And being transformed, it's acting upon you. God is going to transform you by the renewing of your mind. As these demons come out, your mind is renewed. As Pastor Mike was saying, that's why you'll see things you didn't see before. I'm constantly seeing things in the Word of God that before I hadn't seen it. I've been in deliverance since 1984, and it's going to continue. So we see here a preparation as they're going to enter the promised land. They're going to enter the promised land, but first they must be prepared. In the same way, remember, this is a parallel for us. The Old Testament, the, the New Testament is in the Old Testament concealed. The, the Old Test, the New Testament is in the Old Testament concealed. The New Testament is the Old Testament being revealed. So they go hand in hand. And so it's important to study the Old Testament along with the New Testament. Where uh, in Ephesians chapter 6, it says that we battle against, not against flesh and blood. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal. That's Corinthians. Uh, it says uh, our enemies are spiritual forces in high places. Put on the whole armor of God that you might be able to stand against the demonic attacks. And so it's talking about principalities, powers, rulers of darkness. This is rank in the unseen world, in the heavenlies. And so as we grow in deliverance, as these obstacles are removed, we start to move into the spiritual world. And our Christ-likeness starts to develop. But it's an integral, as we make the Word of God an integral part of us. I've mentioned that before. You have to own it. It must become yours. Or else you may just have a religious facade. The definition for expository preaching, I... I like it because it, this is the way it goes. The communication of a biblical concept derived from and transmitted through a historical, grammatical, and literary study of a passage, biblical passage, in its context, which the Holy Spirit first, first, first applies to the preacher 
and then through the preacher applies it to the hearers. One of the biggest problems is that many preachers are preaching what they don't practice. And as you grow in discernment, I might as well say this, you're going to notice it, you're going to see it. Why? Pray for them. Because they are God's anointed, they're called to that position, and that is God's job to deliver them. And listen to the other parts. Don't become blinded that you don't hear what the preacher is saying because you're hooked up on his incorrections and where he's not hitting the nail on the head. Pray for him. Pray for me. I pray for you, and the more you grow in discernment, believe me, the more you're going to see. And God counts us on us to be spiritual warriors. The binding and loosing, the spiritual warfare, hitting the heavenlies, wow. As you move through this, you see by experience that this works. I was talking about my illness, losing the use of my legs. Boy, you better believe I bind and loose it. I did spiritual warfare. Lord, if this is of you, if it's an affliction to keep me humble and useful in your kingdom, Lord, let it be. However, if it's an attack of the enemy, I will attack him with all my might that you have given me. Because you gave me power over all the power of the enemy, you said, Lord. That delegated authority, and I'm going to use it no matter how I go down. We learned that. I'm not talking about myself. I'm talking about you, all of us. I hear testimonies about binding and loosing and spiritual warfare. However, it's not all about us in our generation. As we read on here, it says, but first I want to cover this. Uh, you notice that it says commandments, statutes, judgments, which the Lord your God commanded you to teach you. Number one, we learn. He's teaching us. He's explaining. Because when you come to the Lord and you study the Bible, guess what? Many things are redefined in your life. The way you saw something, you no longer see it that way. Somebody asked me a question this morning downstairs, and I enjoy questions. What's so important about that? I said, because if you have discernment, you will see that the person that uses this is biased and feeding the people his, their bias. They're making a claim without substantiating. And any time you make a claim, you must be ready to substantiate the word of God does. It says in the mouth of two or three witnesses, his word is established. God's word, when he put down, he moved it, it has dual authorship. When the Lord inspired these men to put down the word of God, he put, like, for example, the major prophets. The minor prophets are saying the same thing. They're witnesses to what he said. He's not telling you to do something he himself doesn't do. You become Christ-like. Well, anyways, and he says that you might do them. We know what the Word of God says about doing. Be ye doers of the Word, not just here deceiving your own self. A person that is not a doer is in danger of becoming deceived, believing there's somebody they're not. I've preached on this before where I said there's the way you see yourself. There's the way others see you. And that can vary. And for various reasons. We were talking about that downstairs in giving a persuasive message, how people could disagree, even if you're right. And how the Lord sees you and how you really are. When the way you really, the way the Lord sees you and the way you really are, you see yourself, you're moving into something that is called preparation for deliverance. <gasps> I want it out, Lord. And then the demons start to scream out and they come out. That's deliverance. And it's all preparation of the Lord as we get into his word. Look at the value of the word of God, of getting into the word of God. So he says, I want you to notice something first. Because people get hung up on this. The commandments. Uh, yeah, the Ten Commandments, we're not under the law, and whatever people always say. By the time you get to be my age, you probably heard just about every argument people have to disprove you. Because there's darkness in them. They don't want it. The statues and the judgments that the Lord commanded to teach you that you might do them. It has a purpose to do them in the land which you possess. Now, this was the problem with the Israelites. They were not doers in the wilderness, remember? 
even wanted to kill Moses, stone him. Moses and Aaron, I believe. You see these different words, these different terms, commandments, statutes, judgments. They all describe the word of God. Blessed is the man that walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of sinner, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. The law, uh, brother, we're no longer under the law. The law means the whole rule of God. That means the word of God. So when you see these commandments, statutes, what Moses was telling them, God's word. Plain and simple, God's word. Also, we have a sure word of prophecy for the word of God. Also, and Peter said that these men, it was not personal prophecy. It was the divine prophecy. That means the word of God, they put it in writing, the dual authorship. God used man. He chose to do it that way, to put it down as they were inspired by him. And then you also see in Galatians chapter 5, verse 16, where it talks about walk after the spirit, not after the flesh. That's another right there where I see it synonymous with obedience to the word of God. You walk after the spirit, which is not going to violate or go against the word of God. And so as you grow, you start to see these things, and your conviction grows there. You say, oh, I hadn't seen it that way. Like I said, I was talking this morning, somebody questioned someone, when I told them, they looked at it, and they saw the wisdom in it. That's our job as older people to hand down that wisdom that the word of God puts in us. I haven't arrived. And I'm not a has-been. I'm still an am becoming. And so are you. We're in progress. We're a work in progress. So this is what he's telling them here. This is a preparation. They're a work in progress for what they're going to meet with. And I'm going to have to get my Bible. I hate to move away from this, but how can I read the scripture if I don't have it with me? You'll see in Deuteronomy, this is it, and I'm going to show you what they're being prepared for. And you'll see it. It's been there all along. And I'm going to do some reading because then, then I can develop it. In chapter 6, verse 1, he says, Now these are the commandments, the statutes, and the judgments which the Lord your God commanded to teach you, that ye might do them. I read that. In the land where ye go to possess it. This is a preparation so when you get there, you must put the Lord first. No other gods, because you're going into a land where they worship foreign gods. You'll see it here. For lack of time, there's a lot I'm not going to go into there. But anyway, so then he says, that you might as fear the Lord, a reverence. Well, as you grow in the Lord spiritually and in your Christ-likeness, you don't have a fear of God. <sighs> and your upbringing determines how you see the Lord. If you had a father or leaders that were very mean, you may perceive God as an old man with a club ready to beat you over the head for anything wrong you do. He's a God of grace. Okay? That you may fear the Lord. So as you grow, I notice, I don't have a, a terror of the Lord, a fear. I'm not afraid of God, but I'm afraid I might hurt him. Not that he might hurt me. Because everything that he's allowed in my life, nothing by sure means hurt you. Not even a crippling thing in my legs could hurt me. But it could teach me. And it could help me sing a song in the night. Like when I had the COVID in the hospital, singing a song in the night, and then he comes through. And lifting up your spirit. Remember, you always see the principal replacement in the Word of God. Remember the Beatitudes, Matthew chapter 5? This is the principal replacement being put forth. Blessed are those that are poor in spirit. They have nothing. I was poor in spirit. You were poor in spirit. But then he quickened us. Somebody was singing this little song that we sing here, and I thought of my notes, which I'm not looking at anymore. I get lost. But anyways, I'm a child of a king. Once I was lost, wretched in sin, but with wondrous affection, the king of all kings. So Matthew chapter 5 shines a light on me. 
Blessed are those that are poor in spirit, for theirs is heaven. Take it, because he's brought you out of your spiritual poverty, lost, blind, wretched, and poor. And he's put a robe of his love around you. He's put a ring on you. I believe that's a signet ring to seal the judgment of the demons as you execute God's judgment upon him. Like David said, don't I hate those that hate you. They cry out for mercy and I beat them down to powder. As you grow in the love of the Lord, you develop a hatred for the enemy as you see his helpless victims. And it converts your heart into the heart of an intercessor. Because that's where your greatest strength is at, is intercession and prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. So you, if you look at the, I'm not going to go through the Beatitudes, but if you look at them, you see, you can see I'm substantiating my claim, you could see the principle of replacement. This for that. Pastor John this morning told me, he said, it's grace, grace, and all grace. You better believe it. That's what that shows. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is heaven. You've been given something we didn't deserve. You've been given a position that's up there to attack the demonic powers and to minister to people. But here's the thing. I better get all my subject back on the subject. As we see here, he says, uh, Hear ye, O Israel, remember this primary application. But remember, there, the land represents our body, our mind, our will, and our emotions. And so when you look at it that way, Pastor Woody explains it in his book. Pastor Mike said, get the material in the book room and learn first because he wants to teach you. The demonic powers are the invaders, the squatters. They need to be kicked out because their eviction notice was signed 2,000 years ago. He says, and these words which I command thee shall be in thine heart. That means they have to be yours, an integral part of you as they go inward, not just with religious words telling people how they should live. It must become an integral part, and before you know it, it's oozing out of you, the word of God, your Christ-likeness. You can fool some of the people some of the time, but you can't fool all the people all of the time. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy might. That's a complete person of you. Your undivided, total love towards the Lord. Giving him the preeminence. Everything else takes second to him. Is what he told the Israelites. And then watch this in verse 7. And thou shalt teach him diligently. Thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children. That's your offspring. And shall talk about them. Watch this. When you when uh, and talk about them when you sit in thine house, the home. House becomes a term. It means your home, your family life. When you sit in your house. When you walk by the way, that's when you go out. I remember coming to church at Hagwidge when my kids were little. They grew up here. One of the, uh, I think one of the preachers said that most of the couples argue on the way to church. I thought, we don't. I'm talking about the word of God to my kids. We continue our Bible study. We left at home. We're not perfect either. And then when we got here, Pastor Willie was confirming everything I said. I said, oh, thank you, Lord. That's how you grow in faith. What I was talking about downstairs when we were in a group there, not only me, but a sister over there and all the others that were there, the Lord will confirm it. And if there's error, he'll expose it if we bind and loosen and we see clearly as he guides us. Teach them diligently. That's making an effort unto your children. And then it says, and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise up. What is this saying? All the time. And i got to speed it up because I run out of time quickly. That means all the time. 
That means God has the preeminence in your home. You know one of the sad things that I saw? My wife and I, we were out in the mission field for many years. We did uh, conferences, seminars. I was the only preacher. The pastor got out of the way. He gave me the church because they didn't know about deliverance. The Lord said he would make me a teacher of teachers. And I didn't understand it until I first preached at the men's leadership conference. I thought, we got a lot of pastors and whatever, and a lot of them got deliverance, hit the floor. And when I went to the conferences, I was teaching teachers. Pastors that had been pastors for years but didn't understand deliverance. Big deal. It's the Lord doing it. It's not nothing, no calling to uh, get proud about. And I see some teachers here that call me for advice and for godly counseling. But anyway, so David said, Thou hast made me wiser than my teachers. Wow. That was always been my goal to get my kids to excel beyond what I did. My dad continuously pushed us. He said, son, I didn't have an education. You have an education. I couldn't make nothing of myself. My dad was the first generation in my family to wear shoes full time. And when he came down here, he brought us down here to help us, his children, his descendants. And I remember him. And I thank the Lord for all the teachings of my dad, imperfect dad with all his faults and failures and my parents. I disobeyed. I did like the Israelites. Murmur, complain, fell in the wilderness. The wilderness represents the world. They came out of Egypt. Egypt represents the world and Pharaoh, Satan and that. They were bondmen under, under Pharaoh. We came out of Egypt symbolically. And then going through the wilderness is to get these barnacles to prepare you for deliverance. But you must have the word of God. Teach these commandments. The word of God. to the, First get them in your heart. And then you lead by example. Number one. Paul told Timothy. Don't let anybody despise your youthfulness. But be an example. All through the Bible you see that we are to be examples. Many times. We're bad examples. I'll pick on myself first. When I disobeyed the Lord. Because I grew up in a Christian church. But I backslid. I have a life of backslide. I taught my children through implicit consent. After that, I saw many Christians, even pastors, teaching their children through implicit consent. Don't smoke. Don't drink. The child looks at it and says, without even thinking, this is a God I can get over on. He doesn't mean what he says. Because they put their father as their role model. And he is. So we teach them good things and bad things. I won't say I taught my kids all good things. I taught them through implicit consent. But repented, brought them to church, and put them under men that, and, that knew what they were saying and men and women that would pray for them. When the devil was condemning me because my children turned out bad, they left. When, once they grew up, they didn't have a choice. They had to come to church. Thursday night, Sunday morning, Sunday evening. And my wife never questioned it. She was right by my side. Those are things that we did right. When I was being condemned by the enemy, the Lord spoke in my heart. You did the best thing any father could do. You put him here under the authority of godly men and women. And my kids practice deliverance. And today, one of my sons, we went out on vacation to uh, Tennessee. Smoky Mountains. Somebody asked me, I said Rocky Mountains. No, Smoky Mountains. Rocky Mountains are on the other side. And uh, when I reminded my son of something, he, he told us to leave our vehicle home, ride with them, him and his wife and his kids. I tried to remind my son of something. He said, Dad, who do you think was my teacher? That explains it all. And throughout my Christian life, I've seen parents, even myself. Oh, you tell your child you shouldn't drink? But you're over here every once in a while toting a weed. I've seen it in, Christ, in Christianity or in the churches. And so he goes on and he says, teach them to your children. It's not for us to keep. See, what happened? We have good examples in the Bible and bad examples. David failed to discipline his kids and suffered tremendously. 
We know the story of David. When Ammon raped his sister and then Absalom killed him, David didn't punish the young man and it brought disaster upon the family. David made his mistakes also. But then we also see fathers that and mothers that succeeded. Hannah gave up her son to Samuel to be raised as a godly man, a godly child. But he says then, he says, teach them diligently to your children. It says, when you walk by the way, when you sit lie down, when you rise up, this is all the time. This is a biblical family. The center of that family is what the word of God says. Some make the mistake and say, well, the pastor said this, the pastor said that. No, no, what does the word of God say? And then when you're demonstrating it by example, living the godly life, you're passing it on to the next generation. But remember what he says here. To thy sons, verse 2, and thy son's son. We see that in Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They live together. I have that in my family. We're a very large family. I've seen six generations in my time right now. I have my wife and I have our kids, our kids' kids, and our kids' kids' kids. And they all, for the most part, many of them go to church and they learn. And they've been under my Bible study. Again, not that I've done perfect, but I made an effort to put them in the hands of the Lord and we pray for them diligently. That's one thing that I will do. I can pray, even if they're rebellious and want to go the way of the world. What made me sad one day is we had a family. We have a lot of family gatherings. We have a big house, big home. We got plenty of property, swimming pool, and everything. God has prospered us from nothing to having spiritual wealth, materialistic wealth. I retired 21 years ago uh, because the Lord led me on how to be free so I could minister out in the mission field and do what I had to do with my family. I spent a lot of family time. There's two basic cultures in the world. Individualism. Me, myself, and no more. Me, my four, and no more. You may have that spirit in you. You don't know. You'll ask the Lord. And there's the familyism. That's the culture of the Bible. Esteem others better than yourself. And I come from a familyistic culture. I was just talking this morning to a sister here. Same, same background, same nationality, same culture, and the other people that were there. And show how we familyism. You esteem others better than yourself. You look out after them. And that carries over in the church and then in the community. The problem with the church is they're in such miserable conditions. Because the parents, number one at home, fail to teach the children what we're seeing here, discipleship. And then the grandkids, discipleship to the Lord. And we've seen deteriorating families, split homes, all because the word of God has been missing in the home. And sure, we're responsible, number one. You see, it starts with the individual here. And then it goes to the family. But the responsibility is on the man and then the mother to pass it on to the children. Like I said, my kids didn't have a choice whether to come to church or not. That wasn't even in their vocabulary. My wife didn't even question it. And when they, you're looking for a pastor, number one in Timothy and in Titus, it says that he must be blameless, the husband of one wife, no promiscuity, no adultery, but then if you look a little closer, he says, one that rules over his own house, having his children in subjection, because if he doesn't know how to keep them in subjection, how could he teach in the church of God? How could he keep it? And that's the problem you see. The training ground was missing there, and this is what Moses is teaching. It starts in the home, and you pass it on. And that's the thing about the familyistic culture, if I have something here, and, we're, and uh, even if it's something to eat and I see someone, I can't help but share it. The individual says, it's mine, I bought it. We had conversations when I worked years ago. I worked at a shop, and then I moved into an office position, and I saw it everywhere. I worked among a lot of men, and then women later in the offices, and the men would say, Did you, have you noticed how the men 
that are family men, married, and have children are totally different than these men that never had children, never married. They're selfish, stingy, and greedy. They never learn how to share. And so maybe this is why Moses is saying, teach it to your children. And look at it. Abraham, Isaac, and Moses were in the same tents. And these generations ran concurrently with each other, simultaneous. They were the next generation and the generation following off of that, and there was a command of the Lord. I and my great grandkids come up to me and say, Grandpa, Grandpa, how come, how come the Bible says this? The Bible says that. I said, oh, you're learning in Sunday school, huh? Well, they told us Jesus is there, and I tell them, and my word is the word of authority, and I'll show them in the Bible. So parents carry a lot of power of influence, but sadly, I've been thinking a lot about it and asking the Lord, Lord, I've been a preacher all these years, ministered to so many people. Who is going to fill my position when I'm gone? Because Yolanda and I, my wife and I married, it'll be, I think, 52 years in January are now the elders the, they come to us for spiritual advice and marriage ministering and everything Lord who's going to fill our shoes will all this disintegrate and the Lord answer me because the majority of my family now is coming back to the Lord my kids are going, they, they don't come here. We go on Zoom for the most part. They stop coming here. They go to a church that's doing deliverance. And with them, they pulled in. My children pulled in. Grandkids, great-grandkids, friends, families, couples. And they're having their mini revival there because they're coming. A lot of them are coming to salvation. A lot of them are rededicating their life to the Lord. Yolanda attends the church with them. I thank the Lord for that. And the pastor mentions me sometimes. He refers to me as Andrea's dad. There's no coincidence. There's no coincidence that he's in deliverance. And I believe he gets on our website. I don't know. The last service, he was preaching on binding and loosing and taking that authority. And then he was ministering also. I get, see, I have, when my kids were here at Hedwich, I had nine set of ears, nine set of eyes. Because in the familyistic upbringing, you are the group, and the group is you. I had nine, nine set of eyes. When the church went through the splits, I had all kind of information coming to me, and I still do, of what's going on in that church. And I pray for that pastor. He's a dedicated pastor with his wife with him and his children there. And Yolanda fills me in on what they're teaching because they invited her. And they're passing it on to the next generation, the next generation, the next generation. They have their youth groups in that, and that's the way I grew up. And that benefited me. Different days of the week, we had the day of the gentlemen. They directed service, they preached, they directed testimonies, they did everything. And then you had the teenagers. They got behind the pulpit, they were, learned, they were taught how to preach. And they were corrected and led. And then we had the day of the children. The little children would give Bible verses. That's the way I grew up. And so I was taught in the way I should go. And when I grew, I didn't depart from it. I came back. I backslid a lot. But anyway, so you see here, we are to pass it on. Binding and loosing. Spiritual warfare. And deliverance. There's a way out. When those things just don't budge, let me pray for you, son. Let me pray for you, daughter. Let's have your mother come over here. Let's have your brothers and sisters lay hands. But the sad thing is, like Pastor Willie used to say, for the most part, many people are Sunday morning glories. Oh, they bloom on Sunday. One time, a preacher, I won't mention from what church, was talking to one of my family members. Like I said, I had nine set of eyes. My wife and I, six kids, and then one grandkid, and then another one that we helped raise. They all attended Hegwich here. When the split was going on, I had information before it even hit the pulpit. And so my kids still tell me what's going on in the world with the gang violence and who's coming out of prison and who's one guy that came out of prison recently for murder, did 14 years. My kids ministered to him, so now he's attending church with his wife. We've been praying for him. And so 
I got a lot of information and I saw one of my family members says, one of my kids, they were talking to one of the preachers and they hung up the phone, but it didn't hang up completely. Oh my God, was he railing into his wife, curse words and everything. And they were shocked. Oh my God, but he preaches a sermon from the pulpit. I said, that doesn't mean anything. It's what's in the life, what has become yours, what is oozing out of you. My wife and I talk about these things. I said, it's in my heart not to take that. It's not mine to return it. It's in your heart not to disrespect the pastor. It's in your heart to honor the children and teach them. Just like anybody else, you don't lord it over them because they don't have a choice until a certain age. Sometimes we have to make decisions for them, but when they get old enough, like my son said, who do you think taught me? Who do you think I learned it from, Dad? And so then after that, I rested assured because I was so independent and driving my own car on vacation and whatever. And so we are to pass it on. Are we passing it on to the next generation? Where will this deliverance go? Are the numbers going to continue to dwindle as the new world order comes in where Pastor Worley says in one of his books that the time is coming when only those that are armed with the spiritual warfare and the weapons of their warfare will be able to survive the onslaught of the enemy because as I say we are living in a generation of demons but I'm going to end with this he says to love the Lord thy God with all your heart and everything but then I want you to see something here and that's in chapter 7 it says, and it shall be our righteousness if we observe to do all these commandments which the Lord our God commanded us. And then it says, when the Lord thy God shall bring thee into the land where thou goest to possess us and cast out many nations before thee and the Hittites. Then he warns them, be careful you don't forget. If we don't give the Lord the preeminence, we soon forget to incorporate his way in our decisions. It happens. It could happen to any one of us. And then later on, I'm going to I'm going to close my Bible because I'm out of time, where it says, and when your children ask you, what does this mean? Tell them we were bondsmen in Egypt. That's why last time when I preach here, I talk about my testimony. And people had the nerve to tell me, you're bragging on yourself. I said, no. Get a life. Get some discernment. I'm bragging on what the Lord did with this drunken, no good bum laying in the street, headed for divorce and to destruction. He took me. I was poor in spirit and incorporated the principle of replacement. Beauty for ashes. A garment of praise. And he did that with each one of us. That's why it says, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, and I will forever be thankful to the Lord, and I'm sure you will too. But it says, when thy children ask, this is why many times when I'm preaching, I'll give my testimony. Because three fingers point to me as I minister to whoever is within earshot of my voice. May the Lord bless you. May you consider everything that was preached here at the workshops, Thursday evening, Friday evening, and all day today. And then... Ask the Lord for your deliverance tonight. That if there's anything here, I didn't even cover, never do cover what I want to, but how are you going to help the children? By incorporating the principles of deliverance and helping them to rid themselves of this bondage. It can be done. And then it's out of your hands as a parent. And somebody may say, well, I don't have children. I'm not a parent. No, but you're a steward of God's word to pass it on the pastor's here that's why it talks about it, it, it like I said Paul told Timothy that this guy must be blameless I mean this goes for all of us he can't be a brawler a drunkard because he's leading by example by implicit consent he's destroying the work instead of helping it in other words your actions are so loud I can't hear what you're saying I rest my case in the Lord and thank you for your prayers please continue to pray for Hegwich Baptist Church, the families, and all those that tune in on Zoom, on, uh, on YouTube, and pray for the messages, the material out of the, the book room, and everything that goes forth. 
I thank the Lord for you. I thank you for Hegwich for all the years that you put up with my family and me. When we were in the rags of our sins coming, crawling here, and I see Brother Jason, the little guy, not very little anymore. He's grown and grown in the Lord, I'm sure, in his family. My wife told me about your daughter coming to the Lord. I praise the Lord, and I rejoice with you. That's the familyistic spirit. It's in the Bible. 